This is part two of The Kingdom of Renly, The False Fairy. And there she is on the cover. And we see Luke, Prince Lucas and his friend Clara in the boat. She's not really a false fairy, is she? She's a real fairy, but she's kind of a trickster. So sometimes what she says is false. You remember another story that's kind of like this that I've read to you before, at least to Acadia? It has to do with a little boy who keeps, who takes care of the sheep and he kept calling and crying, wolf, wolf, he'd run into town. And he says, the wolf is coming. The wolf is eating the sheep. And the townspeople would go up there and there was no wolf and the boy would just laugh. And then he did it again. And then what happened the third time? That's right, there really was a wolf and nobody believed him. This is sort of like the story of the false fairy. But we've gotten over that now because, as we know from reading part one, what has happened is that Prince Lucas and Clara now believe Falk, who is the false fairy, and they're all in the boat and they're following the dark cloud. They have their friend Grom the wizard with them, and they're following the dark cloud that has bewitched the other fairies with this uh, strange music. And let's see if we can... Uh, Let's see if we can find the right chapter. Chapter 6. <clears throat> ah, here we go. Chapter 6. Shapes in the Clouds. We have no time to lose, Lucas cried, running up the gangplank with the others close behind him. They cast off and headed east in a blustery wind. The ship creaked and heeled to one side. That means it rocked over to one side. It's, a, it's rough waters, there's bad weather. White caps foamed on the crests of the dark green waves. The sun poked out between clouds and its rays shimmered like spotlights on the water. Falsk stayed close to Clara, who leaned on the rail and studied the choppy waters for clues. Do you think I'll ever see my fairy friends again? Falsk asked sorrowfully. What if the last thing they remember about me is how I tricked Amber Quill into jumping into a mud puddle? Clara looked the false fairy in the eye. You must think good thoughts and be strong for your fairy family, she said. Falsk nodded as a tear rolled down her cheek. If we do find the fairies, I promise I'll never play another prank for the rest of my life. <clears throat> Then Clara held a finger to her lips. Shh, she said. Do you hear something? Falsk listened. An eerie tune whistled in the wind. Ooh. Remember what this is? See, it says, Ooh. What do we call that? That's right. We call it an onomatopoeia. That's a literary a device where you have a bunch of letters and the letters pronounce a sound. It's not a word, it's just a sound that's called an onomatopoeia. You'll learn that in the seventh grade probably. Falsk instantly knew what this bewitching sound meant. That's the song that charmed the other fairies. Swiftly, she slipped her hand into her pocket and pulled out a tuft of milkweed fluff to push into her ears. Get below, Falsk, the prince shouted. Ruskin, help her down. The red dragon led Falsk into the ship's cabin to get her further away from the strange humming sound. Then he returned to the deck. <clears throat> Everyone else remained on alert. Wow, the seas look pretty rough. They studied the sea and sky for more clues. Soon, their imaginations began to play tricks on them. Each wave seemed to swell with monster faces, and the clouds took on beastly shapes. Yeah, you see, it looks like monster faces in the water. Lucas shinnied up the mast and climbed into the crow's nest attached to the masthead. The crow's nest is a little basket up on top of the mast that people go up so they can see better. That, that is the crow's nest right there. You can sit in there. Yeah, you're probably going to get seasick if the weather's like that, but maybe Lucas won't. <clears throat> he put his hand to his brow, scanned the horizon, and spied a dark cloud. 
There's something strange about that cloud, Lucas thought. It was as if it had wings and a body. The prince slid down the mast and reported his finding to Clara and Grom. They began to track the cloud, too. I think that something is hiding in the cloud, said Lucas, a creature to be exact, and I'd bet anything that the scale we have belongs to it. It is moving faster than the other clouds, Clara noted. Grom noticed it, too. And the whispering flute song is growing quieter as the cloud moves away. Lucas gnawed on one of his knuckles as he watched the dark shape. We'll never catch up to that cloud in this clunky old ship, he complained. It's much too slow. Clara sighed. You're right, she agreed. Grom opened his satchel and pulled out the scale the fisherwoman had given them. It's time we put a tracking spell on that creature in the cloud, he said. A tracking spell. Clara's face brightened. That would be great, but it still doesn't solve the problem of our slow ship, she said. Grom dropped the scale back into his satchel. Our ship does need more power, he said. Can you think of anyone right for the job? Lucas and Clara gave each other a puzzled look. Then Lucas's eyes grew wide. Do you mean Ruskin? Oh, they're going to have Ruskin pull the ship. <clears throat> chapter, what's that, that number? Seven, chapter seven. There's Grom and Prince Lucas up on top of the ship. The spell. Is Ruskin strong enough to pull a ship? Asked Lucas. Probably not, Grom answered, but he could pull a smaller boat. Grom walked toward a large dory, a lifeboat. There we see it in the picture on the left. That's a lifeboat hanging from the side of the ship. Lucas sized up the dory. It's perfect, he declared. Then he gave orders. I'll lower the boat. You two get started on the tracking spell. Grom and Clara hurried below and told Falsk and Ruskin the plan. Then Grom set a mortar, this is a mortar, that's something you grind with, uh, and pestle, oh, this is a mortar and that's a pestle. One of these is a mortar and the other is a pestle. That's where you grind up some kind of special potion. Anyway, he set them on the galley counter. He opened his spell book and laid out the ingredients for a creature tracking spell. Look at all these ingredients. Okay, here we see there's a list uh, on this piece of paper on the right, and the list says it's a tracking spell. It will track uh, a, a monster or an animal of some kind. Okay, this is what you need. One, one body part from the creature to be tracked. A hair, a fingernail, a scale, dander, or shell. Okay, so they have that. One cup orange blossom honey. Hopefully you have that. One half turnip, one handful of gooseberries, one swoosh of snail slime. No, I see a snail so they can get some snail slime. <clears throat> Clara handed the ingredients to Grom one at a time. It's a good thing you had uh, to pick up all of these spell ingredients in Primlocks today, Clara commented. Grom cut the root from, the t from a turnip. I'd say it was a good thing we all went to Primlock's today. The wizard ground and mixed the spell ingredients with the mortar and pestle. Then he unclasped a silver medallion, which was also a locket, uh, from around his neck and filled it with the potion. Okay, so he put it in that thing there. With all in place, Grom chanted the tracking spell. Okay, let's see what it is. Okay, this is the tracking spell. Pursue Mora, pursue a mist, hot on the trail of an unknown beast. Track it down in a high-speed chase, then make known its hidden face. Okay, let me, let me chant that one more time. Pursue Mora, pursue a mist, hot on the trail of an unknown beast. Track it down in a high-speed chase, then make known its hidden face. Poof! Sparkling light and glitter swirled from the locket. It rippled out of the cabin and up into the sea air. Okay, so maybe they have to follow the locket now. 
Grom fastened the locket around Ruskin's neck. Oh, so there you see it on the right. The locket's around Ruskin's neck. Follow me, Grom said to the dragon. Falsk, stay below until I return. Lucas, Clara, and Ruskin climbed into the dory. Grom handed them a basket of water and food. Then he lowered the boat into the water. Lucas tied a harness around Ruskin and secured it to the boat with a heavy rope. There you see, Ruskin is going to pull the boat now. <clears throat> Ruskin took flight and began to carry the dory swiftly through the waves. Meanwhile, Grom returned to the cabin and cast a strong protection spell on the children and Ruskin. Then he told Faust that she could unstop her ears. The humming is out of range for now, he said. The frightened fairy pulled the fluff from her ears. Is there a terrible monster out there? She asked. Grom heaved a great sigh. The sound is coming from some kind of creature, but a terrible monster? He paused. Only time will tell. Chapter 8. Rumblings. Stars dotted the sky like starry gems. The sea... I'm going to get this book in the middle here so you can read it. Let's see, this is chapter 8, Rumblings, R-U-M-B-L-I-N-G-S, Rumblings. Stars dotted the sky like starry gems. The sea had calmed, and Ruskin pulled the dory quickly across the water. There had been no sight or sound of the creature since they had left the ship. We'll have to trust the tracking charm, Lucas said. Clara nodded, and our wits, she added. Lucas and Clara took turns watching and sleeping. Ruskin took breaks for fish snacks and water every hour. Soon, the sun began to rise. Clara spied something in the distance. An island, she cried, pointing. Lucas rubbed his eyes and sat up. Sure enough, there was a strip of land on the horizon. I never knew there was an island out here, said the prince. It's definitely not on any map. Ruskin flew faster, seeing land up ahead. Soon the boat scuffed along a sandbar. Lucas and Clara hopped into the shallow water and undid Ruskin's harness. Then they pulled the boat onto the beach. The morning sun felt warm on their backs. Ruskin squawked and ran toward the edge of a jungle. Hmm, it's a jungle on the island. There they are. There's a little boat. It just came uh, onto the sand. And there's Clara. And we see Lucas and Ruskin. Come on, Lucas said, following Ruskin toward the trees. Ruskin sniffed out a path into the jungle. The path led them under a thick canopy of trees. Ruskin found a freshwater stream and splashed into it. He stood under a waterfall. Oh, there we go. There's a waterfall. Ruskin's uh, getting some water. He's drinking, and we see Clara. She's drinking, and it looks like Lucas is drinking, drinking the water. Uh, so anyway, Ruskin lapped the falling water. Lucas and Clara drank, too. Then they walked along the path lined with trees, vines, and flowering bushes. Insects clicked and buzzed in the branches. This island reminds me of Primlock, said Lucas. It's so beautiful and lush. Clara pushed a vine out of the way. I wonder if it's fairy magic, she said. Ruskin stopped and looked up into the umbrella of leaves. He barked loudly. Look at that. Can you see that, girls? I bet you can. <clears throat> Lucas looked up and drew in a sharp breath. There is fairy magic here, he cried. Clara leaned her head back. Sarah, several fairies flew overhead. The children spied Rainbow Frost, Amber Quill, even Queen Sophie. Hey, down here, Lucas called, beckoning with his hands. Clara waved too. Hello, calling all fairies, she cried. The children shouted, whistled, and clapped their hands, but it was no use. The fairies didn't seem to hear a word they were saying. They must still be in a trance, cried Lucas. Shh, be quiet, Clara said. I think I hear something. Lucas stopped and listened. Something close by rumbled and rattled. It sounded like a wheeze, 
deep down inside the island's throat. It's coming up behind that hanging moss, Clara whispered. The thing rasped again, and Ruskin began to growl. Lucas put a hand on Ruskin's head to quiet him. Then what sounded like claws scraped against rock, followed by a thunderous flap, flap, flap. That sounded like very large wings, whispered Lucas. Clara looked at the prince. What do you think it is, she whispered. Thwap, thwap, thwap. More anonymatopoeia. Lucas shrugged. Whatever it is, it's not human, he said quietly. Then a twig snapped under Clara's foot. The children froze. The creature grunted. Lucas laid a hand on Clara's shoulder. Let's find out what's over there, he whispered. Right behind you, said his best friend. Okay, they're going to walk over and see what it is. Oh. Can't even imagine what it might be. What could it be? What could it be? What could it be? Uh oh, look at that. Oh, I went too many pages. Chapter 9 Trapped! Trapped! T R A P P E D! Exclamation point! That indicates some excitement. If you see that exclamation point, it's like a one with a dot below it. That means there's some excitement. It's, somebody is exclaiming. Look at that dragon. Chapter 9. The children gently pulled back the curtain of moss and peeked between the branches. There stood a shimmering beast at the mouth of a dark cave. It had the body of an enormous dragon and the wings of a monstrous bat. Purple, blue, and silver scales neatly overlapped one another like shingles on the body. The scales looked just like the one the fisherwoman had found. Two curved horns rose up from the crests of the beast's head. So you see it on the head, the horns? while thousands of hairy spikes ran down its back. The tip of its tail curled like a snake. Lucas blinked. It's huge, he whispered. Clara swallowed hard. Do you think it's friendly? She asked uncertainly. Eh. Oh, I gotta take a drink of water. This is too exciting. Drink of water. Okay, I don't know about friendly, but it sure looks powerful, Lucas responded. Ruskin barked. Shh! Lucas shushed sharply, but it was too late. The creature locked its glowing crystal eyes on all three of them. There's Ruskin. He doesn't realize he's very small compared to this dragon, and so he barks, and the dragon then sees them. Lucas dropped the curtain of moss to escape its stare. Bad boy, Ruskin, he scolded. We didn't even have a plan yet. Ruskin squawked and raised his wings. Then he flew through the drape of moss straight toward the creature. There they are. There's Ruskin and the creature. What's he doing, cried Clara. They peered through the moss. Ruskin landed in front of the creature and began to chirp and bark. He's trying to talk to the beast, Clara said. We have to stop him, said Lucas. Lucas and Clara flung back the moss and charged toward Ruskin. The beast fastened its gaze on the children and began to thunder toward them. Uh-oh, this is trouble. I think they should have let Ruskin try to engage in some diplomacy before they ran toward the beast. But they were trying to protect Ruskin. <clears throat> Run, Lucas yelled. Lucas and Clara darted back into the jungle. The beast began to flap its heavy wings and took flight. Lucas and Clara kept going. Then, from above the treetops, they heard the eerie humming. It was the same sound they had heard from the ship, but it was much, much louder. Ruskin squawked overhead, too. The children stumbled over plants and roots as they raced down the path. Then they burst out into the jungle onto the beach. They barreled toward the boat. Then whoosh! 
All at once, the enormous beast swooped down and landed on the beach, in between the kids and the boat. The enchanted fairies of Renly swarmed around the great beast. The children froze. Oh no, Lucas cried. We're trapped. See, the fairies are they're kind of small up there because the beast is so large. See the fairies flying around? Ooh, yeah, they're flying right. There's one. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, let's see what's going to happen now. They're trying to get on the boat, and the dragon swooped around and landed right between them and the boat. Chapter 10, Brave Little Wings. A fairy fluttered down from a palm tree above the children. She landed in the sand directly in front of the creature. Lucas and Clara looked at each other in alarm. It's Faust, Clara whispered. The creature lowered its serpent face in front of the fairy. Faust trembled wildly. Oh, Faust is very afraid, but she's trying to protect her friends, so she swooped down right in front of the beast, and now she's so afraid. I, I, I am Faust, she began shakily, the last fairy of Primlocks, and this is Prince Lucas of Renly and his best friend Clara. The beast grunted and relaxed his wings. We mean you no harm, the brave little fairy went on. We have come to gather my friends, these fairies who surround you, to bring them home. Okay, so she's talking to the dragon, and the dragon's kind of listening to her. The dra dragon's relaxing a little bit. That's good. We've got some diplomacy going on. Then, to everyone's surprise, the creature spoke. I know not of Renly, it said in a deep, gravelly voice. The place where you stand is Siren's Island, and I am Siren. I sleep most of the time, sometimes for years. When I wake up, I go out in search of food. This time, these tiny flying creatures followed me home. I know not why. Grom, who had rowed in from the ship, stepped from his small boat and walked up the beach. I know why, great Siren of Siren's Island, said Grom. The fairies of Primlocks have been bewitched by the hum of your spikes when you fly. The beautiful melody has put them in a trance. Siren tipped his scaly chin toward Fausk. How is it this one stays awake, he asked. Fausk knew the beast was talking about her, but she couldn't hear what he said. She looked to Grom. Her eyes are filled with milkweed fluff, he said. It shields her from your bewitching song. Siren nodded. This tiny, tiny creature is brave to talk to a beast of my size. She had no way to know that I am friendly. I would like to call her Brave Little Wings. Brave Little Wings. So she has a new name now. Lucas, Clara, and Grom turned to Faust and bowed their heads. The wee little fairy had risked her life to save them. Uh, then Lucas stepped forward. She will be greatly honored, the prince said. But tell us, how can we wake the fairies from their trance? Siren shook his head. I know not how to awaken them, he said. But I know, said Grom, the fairies will wake up when they leave Siren's presence. Then there will be nothing to hypnotize them. I meant no harm, the ancient dragon apologized. I cannot control my wing song. You must get the fairies back to their home. So it was an accident. They weren't intentionally bewitched. It was just the noise that his little spikes made when he flew along. Clara looked out to sea but we have no idea where we are. Siren lifted his mighty head. Then I shall lead you all back, he said. The travelers boarded the ship and sailed home. 
They followed the siren's mystical cloud, which they had learned was his camouflage, a thick mist given off by his scales. The fairies trailed behind the dragon in a great swarm. Wait until our families hear about this, Lucas said, as they sat down in the cabin with Falsk, who had uh, who had to stay away from the hum of the siren spikes. Clara cut a piece of oatmeal bread from a thick loaf. More important, wait until the fairies hear that Falsk saved them all, she said. Falsk fluttered close to Lucas and Clara. Do you think the fairies will like me now, she asked. Lucas smiled. That depends, brave little wings, he said. Have you become a trustworthy fairy? Faust nodded firmly. From now on, I will never play another trick, she said, and I'll be truthful, honorable, and kind. And this time, everyone believed her. The end. Oh, what a sweet story. That was a great book. I enjoyed reading that, and I will uh, find another book and read some more to you on the next video. Bye-bye, girls.